live. Hi everyone, hopefully we are back online again. Uh, thanks for bearing with us just for that couple of minutes while we change position. Um, so we've come round to the meerkat exhibit, which is a very kind of typical uh, zoo exhibit in terms of being um, open top. So there's no barrier between us and the animals inside. Um, we're public side. Uh, we had some comments just as we were on that uh, tiger bit there, just um, making the observation that how do we do it from a normal visitor's point of view. So absolutely stood visitor side here, the little fence behind us, and then we have um, some meerkats. We have got a slight advantage because we have um, uh, Jen, the keeper again, who's a bit of a meerkat magnet, so she can kind of make sure that the meerkats are coming out. So we've lost them all for a moment because they've all run that way to go to the gate um, that Jen's going to come through in a moment. She's going to end up meerkat side so she can be rustling the animals for us. Um, I did actually, just as we were getting the, um, uh, the camera running there, I don't know if um, I, uh, we can get the camera on that. Uh, Aidy's behind the camera now, so... That's just a shot just we got just as we walked up. Um, very typical meerkat picture. Um, they're just uh, on sentry duty on the rock there. And again, 300 mil lens on a full frame camera. Nothing particularly uh, uh, complicated about that at all. Nice and simple. But hopefully we can talk about a few other things. Just while we're waiting for the meerkats to appear, um, just to remind you guys that the photography show was uh, sadly cancelled in March, but is come back online um, for September and cam um, ready for everyone um, for that photography show online. Um, let's uh, just see what we can do with the meerkats. Jen's back out again. We might move this way a little bit. Could you put some on the rock, Jen? Yeah. There we go. So we've got some bugs and we've got some little biscuits. And we're just getting the guys just milling around. Um, just kind of finding a finding a picture that we think is going to work. Arguably, you don't want a picture of a meerkat eating a biscuit. Um, but it just gives us an opportunity to make sure that the uh, meerkats are out. So I don't know if we can get the camera a little bit closer so you can just see what we've, uh, what we've got here. Fairly big group of meerkats just out on the rocks here. Quite a nice picture opportunity because they are quite um, a long way from the background. So we should be able to get the meerkat in focus and get the background nicely out of focus. So we can get um, nice kind of shallow depth of field pictures. Um, what it might be worth doing, when when you've got some food out, Jen, might be if you pop over onto the, pop over on our side again, then it, it encourages them to be looking this way. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so hopefully we'll get somebody come up again. Um, in terms of in terms of settings, it's a little bit brighter here than it was at the Tigers. So we're at about six uh, fortieth of a second at f5.6 at ISO 800. Um, so we could probably afford to bring that ISO down a little bit if we wanted to. And I guess this is one of the big... Um, changes that more recent development in cameras has enabled is the more routine use of higher ISOs. Had we been stood here in the past we would have been possibly reluctant to push ISOs a bit higher but modern cameras are all super good at uh, generating quality images at higher ISO. So as I say historically I would have been a bit more nervous about that um, but in the modern world 800, 1000 ISO, really not a problem at all. Um, things like uh, this fantastic 1DX Mark III, we can push up to crazy numbers. We've been doing shots at 6,400, 8,000, 10,000 ISO and getting remarkably good pictures. Um, but that is, um, you know, kind of exceptionally good if you like. But um, other cameras, uh, Janet's using a 90D, 90Ds, that kind of stuff. Uh, that's a uh, uh, 1.6 crop APS-C sensor, uh, the latest in the line, perfectly good at running at 800 ISO without any issues at all. And that higher ISO is going to give you just a little bit more security in terms of your other settings. You're buying yourself some flexibility by having a higher ISO, higher sensitivity. If the camera needs less light at those higher ISOs, then it is more able to run at shorter faster shutter speeds 
potentially in combination with slightly smaller apertures. So those things are both useful. For this kind of picture, I'd be looking to not have um, the aperture particularly wide anyway, because we want that shallow depth of focus, that shallow depth of field to throw the background out of focus. Um, so apertures between um, 5.6 and uh, you know 2.8 would, would be good for that, um, just to have that uh, shallower depth of field. Uh, I think I think I said the wrong thing then. Janet's saying I said the wrong thing. Wide apertures, not small apertures. Um, this is what happens with live stuff. You say wrong things sometimes. But yeah, wider apertures, uh, smaller numbers, um, 5.6 or wider would be good for that. Um, so let's um, let's see if we can do some pictures. Um, if if you're in more uh, more conventional lenses, perhaps things like 75 300, 70 300s, uh, Janet's using um, the super popular uh, Canon 100 to 400 um, L series, the Mark II lens. Super super good lens for this kind of thing. That focal length range of 100 mil to 400 mil particularly on an APS-C 1.6 crop sensor is very, very useful, very um, kind of big range. We can zoom back to um, 100 mil, effectively 160 mil, and get relatively wide shots, and then all the way into 400 mil, 600 mil equivalent on the crop sensor body. So that's really kind of useful. So, and those lenses are perhaps a little bit more, a little bit more affordable. Um, for a lot of the photography that we do here at the park, the 100-400 is, if you like, a sort of standard lens. It's the lens that sits on the camera if we don't have um, a preference over and above that kind of thing. So those kind of lenses will work exceptionally well. There is usually a little bit of a conversation about whether you're better with a crop sensor body or a full frame body. And I guess to a degree, my view on that is it probably doesn't really matter. They just do slightly different things. Um, so the crop sensor bodies will have uh, that leg up in terms of magnification on the lenses. So it makes your 400 mil uh, closer to a 600 mil equivalent. Um, so that sort of thing is really useful. But you do have to bear in mind, you do have a slightly smaller sensor. So those cameras will be slightly less efficient in terms of low light shooting. So uh, full frame cameras tend to do that very well, particularly uh, cameras like the 1DX Mark III, which are kind of set up with that in mind. Low light photography is uh, clearly a, a target for that camera to kind of achieve. So the meerkats have all gone into foraging in the rock mode. Um, so. Let's just get um, um, the camera to do a quick little shot of them uh, looking at the rock for a second. So just thinking about how animals behave, it's of course worth bearing in mind that you can do just kind of simple things. When you are visiting your uh, local zoo, um, you could uh, endeavour to find out about things like um, feed times, you know, so uh, most animals like the meerkats will have perhaps one or two feeds uh, during the day, um, which are probably scheduled and may even coincide with a keeper's talk or um, so some kind of interaction for the visitors. So those are kind of key times for you to head along to that exhibit in the knowledge that those animals uh, are going to be out. And of course, there's no substitute for just being a little bit patient sometimes. You know, animals, if you give them time, will do different things. So it's amazing that if you, you know, walk past an exhibit um, one moment and then perhaps come back half an hour or an hour later, everything has changed. The animals are in um, a different position and are doing different things. And if you've got some time and you can be a little bit patient, then that's when you um, get to see different things and you can capture different bits of behavior. Certainly something that we find here, um, just knowing kind of um, a little bit about the animals, knowing a little bit about their routines can really help uh, with the success of the pictures. With these kind of guys, you're just trying to get something that might elevate the picture above um, a normal portrait. So if you can get a little bit of behavior, doesn't have to be anything big and exciting. When I'm talking about behavior, it might just be um, an attentive look or standing up and lifting a paw or maybe 
uh, greeting another meerkat or grooming another meerkat relatively small bits of behavior which just start to introduce an element of story into the shot then there's there's something that the picture is saying beyond it being a static portrait shot so those are the kind of things that we would be looking for in terms of timing the pictures just thinking about you know what we want to achieve and these guys are great because they'll give you that opportunity you can you know stand here for as long as you like you can be stood here all day if you want to and you can just watch their behavior watch what they're doing time the pictures um one thing you might want to think about is just um how uh you know how low you are so getting down on eye level with them um a little bit lower tends to be uh, good and again this enclosure is pretty good for this because it points the fence is relatively low so i can get the camera maybe a meter off the ground and if the meerkats are up on the rocks there they're probably higher than me so i'm actually looking up at them a little bit which gives a very different perspective so low is always good and that gives you just maybe something else to think about um, uh, which is a good thing so there's all sorts of different things that you can um, consider These guys are always anticipating the food and uh, Jen's got a nice little box of bits and bobs there. They are very keen on the bugs so they'll, they'll be quite insectivorous and that's a good thing. We've got one up on the top now, maybe that's good. Just kind of that kind of thing, you know, there's a little shot just of uh, one of them just looking slightly to one side. Um, Got to be quite quick, of course, that all that only lasted a second or two. So okay. getting yourself set up to be quite reactive to the situation. I have actually just changed the way that the camera's uh, metering here. I was uh, over at the Tigers, I was on evaluative metering mode which is the kind of standard default position for the cannons where uh, they're taking multiple readings from around the frame and evaluating that gives you nice balanced results but because i've got relatively uh, mid-tone meerkats and quite a dark background i've actually switched to spot metering and that means the camera's looking just at the part of the uh, the frame that is covered by that um, that spot metering um, this camera is clever in as much as the spot metering follows the focus point so if i put the focus point to one side then it's metering off of that area you might just want to check on the spec of the camera you're using just to see how that works um, in terms of whether you uh, have that uh, ability to move the spot with the focus point or whether it's always fixed in the middle but um, that is certainly helping that kind of picture because you can see the background's nice and dark and we have a meerkat that is um, pretty much correctly exposed so that's kind of exactly what we would be hoping for in terms of uh, getting getting that result I don't know if you can see that's not the most scientific way of showing you a picture um, you can also, I mean, this one's got uh, the ability to show on the review screen which focus point was active um, at the time. And um, I've got that switched on. You can see that focus point is, is bang on his eye on that frame. So I am fairly confident if the focus point's on the right place and the autofocus is running properly and I've got a sufficiently fast shutter speed, uh, that shot was at... Uh, that was at 2.8 aperture, uh, nice and wide, very wide in fact, and at 800 ISO is giving me one thousandth of a second shutter speed. Um, probably if I was thinking about that a bit more, I would probably close that aperture down a little bit, maybe down to um, f5.6, and then uh, 5.6 is giving me um, about 640 again, so still pretty good speed, and that's uh, the advantage of using those slightly higher ISOs. Depending on what um, file type you're shooting, we tend to shoot uh, predominantly with RAW files, which would be fairly common. Um, actually, we often shoot RAW files and JPEG files. That just gives us a little bit of versatility in terms of what we're gonna end up doing with the pictures afterwards. Obviously, the JPEGs are gonna roll out the camera and we can use those straight away if there's some time pressure in using the images, that's a good thing. Um, but the raw files give us just that little bit more latitude in terms of post-production. If you are shooting JPEG files, you might want to think about uh, things like the white balance and the uh, picture style or picture control. Um, actually, uh, 
this camera is set up to a standard picture profile, Canon standard, which we tend to leave it on most of the time. And it's running on automatic white balance at the moment. If I was being fussy about those JPEG files, I might tweak that a little bit. Certainly I might tweak the white balance. I might tweak the white balance from auto, maybe to cloudy. When the cloudy preset is uh, letting the camera know that the light we're shooting in is a little bit colder, a little bit bluer. And then the camera will add a little bit of warmth, a bit of yellow um, into the processing for that JPEG file and uh, warm that resulting image up a little bit. That's probably quite a good thing. And just switching between those presets on white balance is, is for most people sufficiently uh, accurate. You know, you can go from a sunny preset to a cloudy preset, even to a shady preset, just to change the way that those uh, colors are coming out, depending on the light you're shooting in. Um, this is all responding to the light that is illuminating your subject. Actually, this is shady light. The sun's out at the moment, so we're in shade. Um, I tend to find on the Canons a shady preset perhaps overwarms the pictures, and cloudy's just a little bit back from that, so that's a, a pretty good compromise. Um, so you can think about those things as well, just depending on, um, just depending on what you want to do. As I say, we tend to shoot both formats, so we've got the raw files to go back to if we want to um, process those pictures up and uh, spend more time working on them. And then we have a large uncompressed JPEG, which we can use straight out of the camera. So if we needed to, we can uh, you know, wirelessly get that onto a phone and put it up onto social media or whatever else it might be. So it gives us something to use uh, straight out of the camera, um, whereas the raw file we can drop back onto uh, as well. So there's lots of different things that we can consider in terms of the things that we're photographing. Maybe let's try and get you a little a close up shot now. These guys just sat on the rock. They're looking quite cute. Lots of different things to see. Uh, Janet's just, we've just swapped cameras. So Janet's just showing me, um, she's made, made the valid point that uh, not everyone's gonna have a 1DX Mark III. So this is just a couple of shots that Janet's just done on the 90D. Um, 100, 400 mil lens. And we know that it's um, a crop sensor. Is that better maybe, change the angle? No, I'm just doing one camera, that's better. Um, crop sensor, 1.6 crop um, with 100, 400. Um, Let's just see what that the settings were on that one. Um, 5.6 800. There we go, Janet sh shouting out. So we're on 800 ISO, aperture value priority, um, f5.6. Um, so oh, pretty similar to what we were just doing. The focal length for that shot was about 300 mil. So we're not on the full end of the zoom and we're still getting like a head and shoulders portrait shot at 300 mil on the 100-400. And that was giving us a shutter speed of 1,600th of a second. So really nice fast speeds. 5.6 has given us a little bit of depth of field and then nice fast speeds on the back of that as well. Um, so, you know, it, it clearly shows that those kind of cameras will, um, you know, clearly deliver as well. So there's another one. Uh, I'll just try and find, a, there you go. You can see, you know, how, how tight those shots can be. Um, with uh, an, a relatively accessible focal length of lens. You're not needing to have kind of big super telephoto lenses for this you know, style of photography. Even at, uh, let's just see what that setting was, focal length wise, that was at 400, that shot was at 400. So that was 400 mil, 400 mil on a crop sensor body. So if anyone's got any kind of questions about that full frame crop sensor, kind of thing then just shout out we'll we'll try and go through that but essentially because uh, the lens is projecting the image back onto a smaller sensor a physically smaller sensor it um, gives you the uh, effective multiplier in terms of the focal length of lens that's why we describe it as a 1.6 times crop which actually in many ways makes no sense at all 
but you apply that 1.6 times multiplier to the focal length of the lens versus a full frame camera to give you an idea of how that lens will perform on a 1.6 crop, a smaller sensor. So um, 100 mil becomes 160 mil, um, you know, etc. So I think I think 400, 640, isn't it? So it's a slightly kind of longer focal length because of that smaller sensor, and that's a real advantage in terms of getting the best out of these kind of lenses. So it's one thing to have this lens on a full frame body where it is behaving like a 100 to 400, and that's very very good. If we pop that on a, a crop sensor body like the 90D then it's uh, 160 to 640 if my maths is right. So that becomes really quite a useful focal length range, particularly if you're doing wildlife, if you're shooting stuff that you're not gonna get as close to as we are to these guys here. Um, but just kind of to bring us a step back uh, to where we started, you know, zoos are a great opportunity. I know they're not wild and I know that there's various uh, observations about that. I think we all appreciate that animals in, in a zoo are not wild, that's quite uh, clearly the case. But as a photographer, it gives you the opportunity, particularly in these troubled times, to access some very interesting and exciting animals and to hone your skills, to practice, to try different things, try different metering modes, different exposure patterns, different, um, focusing operation in a very kind of controlled environment and you can end up with some really pleasing images you know just kind of portraits of meerkats portraits of tigers all those kind of things so they're a great opportunity for us to all be getting out and doing some pictures um, particularly when we can't perhaps travel to the places that we might wish to and importantly from a photography point of view develop and hone those skills to give you some practice um, it's really clear from uh, the stuff that we do. We're photographing in the park uh, all the time. Obviously, we had the um, kind of advantage of uh, right the way through uh, this year, we've been fairly much you know, locked in here. So we're here shooting every day. Um, but it's amazing how that uh, practice really makes you improve in terms of your efficiency with the camera. You're knowing how the camera's gonna behave. You're knowing how you want the camera to be set up. You're fine tuning those settings to match the situation that you're in. Um, the nice thing about the Canon cameras, we're using all Canon cameras. We've got everything from 1DX Mark III's right the way down to the 90D here. Um, but the interface is all very similar. So we can kind of jump from one camera to the other and still know where we are, still know where we are with the settings. And that familiarity with the camera, familiarity with what you're doing can be, bring really big benefits in terms of your efficiency. So I'm just checking the time. It looks like we've got about five minutes or so left. So if anyone has got any questions, now's the time to shout out. Just to remind you guys that I know Camera World have got some very cool offers, as we said earlier, to tie in with the uh, postponed uh, photography show event postponed from March through to online, online only in September. So definitely worth checking out their website, see what deals they've got. Anything we've talked about in terms of cameras or lenses or anything like that, uh, those guys are the guys to speak to in terms of stock availability and prices and deals, part exchange, all that kind of stuff. I know they're all super good at those things. So definitely speak to them about those bits and bobs. Um, so um, lots of things to think about there. Of course, whatever cameras you've got, whatever um, equipment you're using, I guess uh, the whole uh, point is to get out there and to shoot some pictures, to enjoy the photography you're doing. Maybe head down to your local zoo. Zoos will need a little bit of support too at the moment. They've all had a tough time this year. So if you can get down to your local zoo, um, buy a ticket, buy a cup of tea in the in the shop, maybe uh, do an adoption with one of the animals, that kind of stuff, you'll know that you're doing some good for them as well. And that's a really nice kind of uh, added benefit of your trip to the zoo to doing some photography. 